it's my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. David Goldhaber Gordon. He's a professor of physics and applied physics at Stanford. Uh, we met actually at a new faculty workshop in DC uh, many years, and I've been uh, uh, wanting to bring him into the series, to which I just found out, um, well, I knew that he had been in the series before, because I always look, because we've had so many people, so many illustrious people in the, in the history of the series, so I go, oh, have you been here before? And of course, of course you had. What I found out from Dr. Joe Ten, Professor Emeritus, who started this series today, um, was that um, Dr. Goldhaber Gordon's great aunt Judith and great uncle Gerson spoke in this series as well. Were you? Were you? Yes. Were you? I, I, I think I had forgotten that they did, uh, but uh, that's, that's wonderful. Yes, very neat. Um, uh, Dr. Goldhaber Gordon has his bachelor's degree from Harvard and his PhD from MIT. His exceptional work in condensed matter physics has earned him many honors and awards. Uh, among them are the George E. Valley Prize of the American Physical Society. Um, he was a recipient of the Hertz PhD Fellowship and has received the prestigious Sloan and Packard Fellowships as well. Um, so uh, I told you the story about <laughs> this long tradition, which was where I was going to say it. <laughs> um, so let's just put our hands together and give a warm welcome to Dr. Goldberg. <laughs> Thank you very much for the welcome. Um, and uh, so I'm David, and I, um, you know, I have a, a couple of stories to tell you, but the main um, point of today is to, uh, to interact. And so uh, please don't hesitate to ask a question. And if you have your hand up and I'm somehow not showing awareness of it, then even call out. Um, I'm very happy to um, answer your question, or to, um, and it's likely that if you're not getting something, if, if something's unclear to you, it's likely that that's true for others as well. Uh, can you hear me uh, well enough? Okay, great. So um, I'm going to tell you today, uh, um, I think, let, let me actually uh, blank this so that it's not distracting. Um, and I'd like to, uh, to ask a question, and this is something that uh, you probably don't have experience thinking about exactly, so, um, so just try. Uh, and the question is, if you had a perfect one-dimensional wire, what would be its resistance? So, yes? If it was a perfect wire, it would be zero resistance. So, so tell me your, your name? James. So James, uh, James pointed out, quite rightly, that no wire uh, um, worthy of the name perfect <laughs> would have resistance, right? Uh, um, so we need to really un unpack this um, this question, um, what is perfect? So what is a wire? Let's start with what is a wire, then what is a one-dimensional wire, and what would be a perfect one-dimensional wire, and then what is resistance? So I think we can problematize pretty much every, um, every word in that sentence, um, except for is, perhaps. Um, <laughs> um, and so what is a wire? Does anyone have an idea of what we mean when we say a wire? Can you tell me your name? Oh, Earl. I Earl. would assume some continuum of conducting material, mm -hmm. uh, usually idealized in via some plane curve. Mm -hmm. So right. So 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 wire is some um, is some conducting material in, in some uh, in some shape, and um, so um, so electrons flow through it. Just like if you wanted to have the equivalent of a wire for light, it might be an optical fiber. Um, on uh, uh, some kind of waveguide that carries the light. Similarly, uh, copper wire is something that carries electrons. So uh, what is one-dimensional? Are you familiar with any one-dimensional objects? Uh, is that Zach? Or yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, a one-dimensional thing which is something that has a length, not a width. So uh, like a fairly long, but no width string. So we're right. So, so, so Zach pointed out that an idealized string is one-dimensional. Um, we don't have any one-dimensional objects in real life. Uh, they're mathematical abstractions. But for practical purposes, we can have things that are, that are low-dimensional. So an example I like to consider is a piece of paper. So we know that if you have a ream of paper, 500 sheets of paper, it has pretty substantial heft, and it's you know, about this thick. 
But if you take one sheet of paper, you're going to write on the large side of it, not on the, uh, <laughs> not, not on the narrow side of it. So for, for a particular application, for a particular uh, context, you can consider something um, to have only two dimensions or one dimension. So what would be the context here for a wire to be one dimensional? Um, well, electrons are quantum mechanical particles. They're, um, they're, they have wave functions, and I, I know there are um, quite a number of undergraduates in the audience uh, in the, um, the seminar. Um, so I, I'm not sure how, how much quantum mechanics you've, you've studied, but uh, I think you know the idea that, um, that in quantum mechanics, things do not have definite positions or definite uh, velocities or momenta. Um, instead, they're spread out in some way. And you may know that the more tightly you can find something, the faster it's going. So that's a version of the uncertainty principle. Um, and so what that means is that if you want to squeeze something down to a very small space, it has a lot of energy, a lot of kinetic energy and kinetic motion. So a one-dimensional wire would be a wire in which all the electrons in the wire have just a single wave function, a single, um, a single spread in the direction that is not the long dimension of the wire. So they're confined to a single possible wave function, just like in a hydrogen atom, um, you have an electron, a hydrogen atom in the ground state, you have an electron in a single, single state there. Uh, it's similar here, except that um, it's only confined in two dimensions, it's extended in the third dimension. So that's what I mean by one dimensional. Um, so it's, it's not zero width. Uh, you might ask, how wide is it? That depends on context. You could have a carbon nanotube. I'm sure many of you have heard of carbon nanotubes. Actually, it was just in the news that, um, uh, that a team uh, from, I think, Tsinghua University in Beijing had, um, has created a nanotube-based composite that seems like it might be strong enough to, um, to hold up an elevator to pull things into, into Earth orbit. Um, uh, so carbon nanotubes are interesting for a lot of things, but the, they are indeed very narrow. They're on around one nanometer in diameter. Um, but it doesn't need to be down to those atomic length scales. Something could act as one dimensional, even if it's pretty large, as long as there's only a single wave function that electrons can sit in. And I, I had mentioned optical fibers. I don't know how many of you have played around with optical fibers, but um, you certainly use them when you uh, have communications. Your signals often have gone for some of their, um, some of their um, journey on optical fibers. Optical fibers can be what are called multi-mode, where they have many different equivalents of wave functions, many different <coughs> patterns of the light in the uh, directions transverse to the motion, or they can be single mode, where there's only one, um, one configuration of the light transverse to the direction of motion. So 1D electrical wires are like single mode optical fibers. Um, so you can see that that's going to mean they'll be about the size of the wavelength, but just as for light, that depends on the energy uh, for electrons. All right, so we now have um, wire, one, um, wire one-dimensional. Um, uh, what about perfect? What do you think would um, be the meaning of perfect other than presupposing the zero resistance condition? So can, can you say what you would need to do to get a wire to have no resistance? Yes, what is your name? Uh, me, uh, Ernest. Hi, Ernest, I'm David. Hello. Um, could it be that the uh, electrons are very close together? So, in, like within that one dimensional space? And because they're close together, there are a lot of them, and so they can carry a lot of current. So that, that's absolutely right, that if you look at uh, conductance through a system, it's a combination of how easy it is for each electron to move and how many of those electrons there are. Absolutely. But if you really wanted to get to zero resistance, then um, you can't put enough electrons in to do it, to do it that way. Okay. So we need to think about the other half, which is uh, what causes resistance. So if any of you encountered what causes resistance, so tell me your name. Well, I, oh, my name is Earl. Earl, thanks. Intra-electron interaction via the 
so uh, so interelectron interactions. So um, so electrons hit each other, and or they um, or they get in each other's way. So that's a very reasonable thought. Um, but let me take you back to freshman physics. So if electrons are like um, uh, super balls, uh, little uh, little very elastic balls that you uh, can collide with each other, and I had two electrons that were coming toward you, Earl, yes. and they hit each other and deflected, um, then what is going to be the relation of their momentum be, uh, and their, their their average velocity headed toward you before the collision and after the collision? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. If I had to make a guess, well, I assume that they would be colli if they're colliding with signal, it's obvious it's going to be an elastic. Doesn't matter if they the elastic, they're like elastic. Uh, yeah, let, let, let's assume that it's an elastic collision. Great. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm almost exhausted myself. Before. No, no problem. Pairs don't scatter; they tunnel. Um, so, uh, can you tell me your name? Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. So, um, so Steve, uh, indeed, uh, the the elephant in the room is superconductors. So, um, the most familiar way to get zero resistance is um, is perhaps the weirdest way, which is uh, that electrons form pairs, and those pairs um, flow without resistance because they're in the lowest energy state of the quantum mechanical system. So those. Steve referred to these Cooper pairs, these pairs of electrons. And so I'm not going to talk about Cooper pairs today. I'm going to talk about just electrons. So it's true that in Cooper pairs, electrons interact with each other or are attracted to each other. Um, and that leads to uh, the behavior um, of, in the end, flow without resistance. But I'm, I'm going to talk today about just electrons each doing their own thing. And in fact, if you, I don't know whether, um, whether in your coursework you derive Ohm's law. But if you were to derive Ohm's law, you would, um, one way to do it would be to say, uh, electrons, why is there any resistance in a material? After all, you can put a voltage on, it's an electric field, and you know that electrons are just going to accelerate and they'll go faster and faster. So why do you need to put substantial voltage on to get a particular current? You should just wait for some time and the electrons will flow faster and faster. And that's basically what happens in empty space, in vacuum. But in materials, the electrons get accelerated for some distance, for some time, and then they hit something and get deflected. And Earl, it was a very good guess that the, what they hit is another electron, but actually what they hit is the defects of the lattice. So uh, in, unless it's a, an absolutely perfect crystal, or even if it's a perfect crystal, if you're at room temperature, everything's jiggling around, and so there are atoms out of place. So it's those, those things, those defects, and those vibrations that tend to deflect the electrons. Um, yes. And David, just to fill yeah. on this, you were talking about the elastic scattering and they bounce, mm -hmm. but yeah. if it's two electrons, they still have their same um, momentum. And, and this yeah. is why you were saying it wasn't, wasn't going to affect the resistivity. Right? Yes, because the, the current is the, the charge of the electron times the velocity that it has times the density of them, uh, as um, James said. Um, uh, so as long as the velocity, or we'll, we'll treat velocity and momentum as sort of similar here, uh, as long as that's maintained, uh, you're not going to um, reduce the current. Um, so, um, all right, so, so if we can establish that resistance is associated with electrons getting deflected, um, then um, what would a perfect wire be? Yes, sir. Uh, something that's no deflections and or reflections in this kind of yeah. transmission. Yeah, so, so Earl said um, a perfect wire would have no deflections, no reflections. If an electron starts out going down the wire, it's just going to keep going. And I'm sorry I didn't uh, see your hand right then. So, all right, so now uh, 10 minutes in, we've gotten what is a perfect one-dimensional wire. It's, a, uh, it's something that carries electrons. There's only one mode that the electrons can go through. They're, they're in a single quantum state, except in the direction of motion, where they're free. And, um, and uh, there's no, no backscattering, no reflection. So, um, so to get no backscattering, what we might do is make a very perfect crystal 
the wire is a very perfect crystal. You know, you can make a perfect crystal of copper. You can um, make perfect crystals of semiconductors like silicon or um, uh, gallium arsenide, which I've worked on more. Um, even with a perfect crystal, as I, uh, as I mentioned, you'd have to make it very cold in order to not have vibrations cause problems. Um, so it's not so easy to make a perfect wire. And so um, one way to get around that is instead of trying to make the wire absolutely perfect in its construction and cooled to very, very low temperature, you could try to uh, design the wire in such a way that there was something akin to traffic laws for electron, for traffic laws for cars. So, so when you're driving down uh, one of the two-lane highways around here um, and you feel that you want to turn around, what do you do? Exit. Yeah, you, you exit. You don't simply say, all right, I'm going to do a U-turn. Right? If, if you do, then don't tell me. Uh, but um, um, So there's, there's a law. Um, and the, the cars can go both ways um, on the highway. And the two, the two directions of flow are right next to each other. So it would be really easy to just turn around. But there's a law saying no U-turns on, on two-lane highways. Um, and so that law helps the traffic flow smoothly because people don't need to worry about a car suddenly turning around. And, and this is an analogy. It's not a direct mapping. But for electrons, if you could have a situation where you had a law, no U-turns, then that would help keep the electrons going in the same direction. And so even if, even if the crystal were not perfect and even if there were some vibrations, the electron would have to keep going. So it turns out that that can be done in a certain mathematical model in what's called a topological insulator. Um, and it also turns out that it doesn't work very well, that the electrons can go a few microns and then, um, then they get turned around. And I spent five years of my life that I will never have back uh, trying to figure out why. And I continue to be curious about it, but, but we haven't figured it out. Um, so, but, but there's an even more powerful traffic law. Um, or a traffic flow pattern, which is divided highways. So if you have a highway where the two directions of traffic are separated by a big berm in the median, then even if you were tempted to make a U-turn, you really couldn't do it. And so that would be more powerful. There's, it, it, you don't need to rely on just the law. You need to rely on the fact that it's impractical to, to turn around. And so if you could get a situation where the electrons only went one way, um, where uh, in a particular wire, the electrons could only go um, one way from me to Joe and couldn't go back from Joe to me, then that would be a good way to ensure that electrons don't turn around. Um, and so it would act as a perfect 1D wire, even if it were um, very dirty, because you know, the electron would you know, want to be deflected, but there's nowhere to go except forward. Um, so, um, so that's, uh, that turns out to be one of the best ways to make a perfect 1D wire. Um, and it's a way that's been known for decades. Uh, some of you may have heard of what's called the quantum Hall effect, um, which has received by now, I would say, three Nobel Prizes. Uh, and it's a very central set of ideas in, in physics. I'll show you something about it soon. But for the, for the moment, the key idea is that it's not reasonable that electrons can only go from me to Joe. Why isn't it reasonable? It's not reasonable because that's now how, not how the laws of the universe work. The laws of the universe, except if you're looking at very tiny and energetic particles, the laws of the universe look the same forward and backward in time. Which means that if I were to, um, to uh, have some particle moving around, <clears throat> and take a movie of it, and then I played the movie to, to, Shannon, uh, to Shannon, and I said, Shannon, was this movie going forward or was it going back? You wouldn't be able to tell. There would be no way to tell because uh, each of them would be um, obeying the laws just as well, the, the equations of motion. The only reason that we, all right, I don't want to get into the arrow of time, which is a wonderful subject, and, uh, but for one particle, you simply couldn't tell whether it's going forward and backward. So how could we have a situation where um, we can break that, um, at least 
at least locally, break that rule of the universe that the, um, that the behavior of particles looks the same forward and backward in time? Do you know any way that you can break that rule? So, um, uh, so, so, did you have an idea? No. Uh, so, let me suggest, um, for those of you who have taken ENM, you might have a situation where uh, particles behave in a way that sort of looks different if you were to play it backward in time. Yes? But if you apply the force to the particle. Okay. Yeah, so, so magnetic is a really good idea here because a magnetic force is going to, a magnetic field will cause charged particles to move around in circles. And if you were to play the movie backward, they would go in circles the other way. Now, if you were to really reverse everything in, in the room, including whatever's generating the magnetic field, then the magnetic field, it turns out, would be reversed also. You know that because if you have an electromagnet and you run a current through it, if you reverse time, the, the current reverses also. But if you, if you have a magnetic field, then that breaks for everything else um, the, the law that things are same forward and backward in time. So that's, that's um, it's possible to break that. It's possible to get electrons going only one way, but you have to do something pretty, um, pretty serious, which is to put on a big magnetic field. So let, let me come back to the question I asked at the beginning. Um, what is the resistance of a perfect one-dimensional wire? And, um, and Earl pointed out, uh, I think Earl, no, sorry, sorry, to James. So James, James pointed out uh, that, um, that, of course, it should be zero. And um, so let's imagine one of these wires where we put electrons in at one side and pull them out at the other. And if we wanted to measure a a resistance, we'd have to think about how do we measure it. So how would you measure the resistance of, um, of a wire or a resistor or something like that? The voltage over the current. Okay, the voltage over the current, but which voltage and which current? Voltage from A to B and then the current going in that direction. So, so I'm going to, I know it's a little dark, but I'll, I'll be going to the board in a moment, uh, to the uh, display things in a moment, but if here's the wire, you could imagine driving a current at one side and pulling it out at the other side and measuring, and measuring a voltage. So we have um, a current that's, a current that's driven through here, uh, well, I guess, a current that's driven through here and measure a voltage between the same terminals that are used to apply the, um, the current. And, um, but another way, to measure, um, uh, another way to measure voltage would be to attach voltage leads to the interior of the wire, not at the end. And this is, this is which is called a four terminal voltage measurement because now you have the contacts to drive the current and two more contacts to drive the to uh, measure the voltage. This has the advantage that there's no current flowing through the wires that are used to measure the voltage. So the current's flowing here, but there's no voltage drop going to your voltage amplifier. Um, and so this is, people often like to measure four terminal voltage. You can sometimes get a more precise measurement of the resistance of something. So, for this wire, do you think that you'd get the same result if you measure the um, resistance in these two ways? For no. One-dimensional infinitely long wire? Uh, so, so good point, Zach. If it were infinitely long, then you'd have a hard time attaching the voltmeter to the ends. Uh, so let, let's let it be a finite length. But long enough that its length is way, way more than the wavelength and not, not important. So I, I think you surmise that I wouldn't be asking if there weren't different answers to the question for those two ways. And uh, it turns out that a, a friend of mine made this measurement 20 years ago on a very perfectly made semiconductor wire. And he found that, uh, he found as, as he had expected, but it was a tour de force experiment, that the voltage between these two points 
was essentially zero. There's no resistance in the wire, as James said. Great. But the voltage between these two points corresponded to a resistance of about 26 kilo ohms. Very different. And you could say, well, maybe that was because there were crummy contacts. But it turns out that's not the case. And so let's, let's think about if you wanted to get electrons into a 1D wire from a big wire, then it's kind of like if you were, um, uh, if you had a, um, a boba straw and, and small, let's say small boba, so, um, or let's not even say boba, let's say we had um, a, a steel straw about the size of a boba straw and then um, little, um, little um, ball bearings, tiny steel balls um, the size of a pea. So much substantially smaller than the straw, but not much smaller. Um, so imagine that you have that straw and you're trying to get the peas in, but the peas are flying, the, the steel peas are flying in all directions because they're, they're in some big wire and the big wire has uh, electrons with all different momenta. So what's going to happen? Most of them are going to miss the straw. And then you can think, well, all right, you don't have to be satisfied with that. You could funnel them into the straw. You could get a steel funnel and um, put that on top of the straw. And now you could throw peas and you don't have to have great aim because they're going to hit the funnel, right? But turns out that's not going to solve your problem because when they hit the funnel, they'll bounce off the funnel. As long as their bounce is elastic, um, you started off with lots of different momenta and you end up with lots of different momenta. And so um, it turns out that in physics, you cannot go from a large phase space, a large set of uh, configurations of a system, let's say a large set of momenta, to a small phase space without dissipation, without losing energy. Yes, tell me Would your name. Would it be possible to use, oh, I'm Jack. Jack, thanks. Would it be possible to use like a magnetic field as a funnel, in a sense, and that would minimize collision? So, so that's a, an excellent idea, Jack. Uh, so you could use a magnetic field to steer things in a certain direction. It turns out even a magnetic field cannot compress the set of momenta that are possible. So, um, so it, can, um, uh, it can steer everything to the right, let's say, but you won't necessarily hit the, um, hit the straw. So, but a magnetic field can be useful there. Uh, it just doesn't get rid of this uh, intrinsic need to, um, to have dissipation, to lose energy. So dissipation for electron flow comes from, from joule heating, the same thing that, uh, that makes, um, makes old-fashioned incandescent bulbs that you're not allowed to use anymore glow, um, that you, you run a current through and, uh, and you get your I squared R um, power produced that, uh, that, that heats it up. So if you, if you have dissipation in this funnel and straw system, how could you represent it? You could coat the funnel with, uh, with rubber on the inside. So now when the steel balls hit the rubber, they lose some of their energy and they roll down. So, and now you can get them into the straw. So you can go from a large wire, the peas flying everywhere, to a small wire where they're all going in one direction and in a narrow space by dissipation, by losing energy. And uh, so, in fact, there was a beautiful measurement done uh, uh, probably about that same time that I was talking about uh, 20 years ago or so, in which um, people made a perfect 1D wire using a large magnetic field like they described and, um, and found that, that uh, in fact, there was heating, but heating only at the beginning of the wire where you come in and at the end of the wire. Similar to when you're getting on a big highway, um, even if the traffic's moving smoothly on the highway, generally there's a bottleneck at the on-ramp and the off-ramp. So, um, all right, so I think we're, we're now more than halfway through, but I think even if you get nothing other than what we've been talking about, uh, I think my hope is that you'll have found something interesting here. 
uh, and now I'm going to try to uh, connect it to, uh, to some cutting edge experiments that are not 20 years ago, but, uh, but in the last year. Um, so, all right, so I'm going to tell you about um, a way to make uh, one of these perfect wires um, without resistance along the wire, but resistance only at the ends, um, using a new class of materials that are called topological insulators. And I'll explain what those are. So I'm not going to expect you to get everything from this picture, um, but I just want you to see that if you put a big magnetic field on and you choose the magnetic field value correctly, you can get a situation where electrons go around the edge of a sample, um, and, but, not, but they're, it's insulating in the interior, but electrons can go one direction around the edge. And if you're interested at the end, I can give you some um, intuition for how that can work. As I said, that's the quantum Hall effect, um, but it requires a big magnetic field in addition to a pretty clean 2D electron system. Um, if you wanted to do this without a big magnetic field, then you'd worry, you, well, you can't break time reversal symmetry, but you actually can by making your material into a magnet. So make the material itself a ferromagnet, sort of like what you uh, put to stick on your fridge to hold up, well, at least I, I hold up my cousin's pictures and things like that. Um, so, um, so this is doing something like what was discovered decades ago, but in a new context where it doesn't require an external magnetic field. So, um, so I was going to talk about two vignettes, but I think I'm going to mostly talk about one vignette, um, and then, um, then we'll wrap up. So, um, so I'm going to talk about um, this resistance that occurs at the ends of the wires, which as I said, is not accidental. It actually has a very specific value. Um, I said it's about 26 kilo ohms, but it turns out it has a much more specific value than that. So let's start out with what the recipe is for getting this uh, system that behaves like it was in a magnetic field, but instead it's, uh, it's just um, uh, magnetism, internal magnetism. All right, so the, the first ingredient in this recipe that we're going to need to stir up is um, uh, what's called a, a topological insulator. Um, so a topological insulator is a material how many of you have heard this term, topological insulator? Okay, great. So a topological insulator is a material that by all accounts should be an insulator. It should have electrons unable to move around. But, um, and that's true in its interior, but at its surface, electrons can move. That in itself is not so special. Um, we've, known for as long, uh, we've known for more than half a century about materials that were were conducting at the surface and not in the interior, but that was always sort of because of dirt or something accidental. Whereas in topological insulators, you cannot get rid of this conduction. Um, there's no way to just add disorder, you know, add uh, atoms of something else and make the, the conduction go away at the surface. You can't make it go away. Just as you can't um, famously change a, uh, a donut into the shape of a sphere, um, so how many of you know the, the definition of a topologist? Yes? Uh, is it somebody that studies the characteristic of shapes and geometry? Yes, uh, exactly. So can you tell me your name? Uh, ben. Ben. So, uh, so yes, I, uh, Earl. I have a joke you're referring yes. to. Okay. Someone you can't tell the difference between a coffee cup and a donut. Yes. So, so you're both, both, of course, right. And um, so... Uh, so it's someone who studies the properties of shapes that are preserved when you distort them. Um, and so, um, so something that has one hole, you can't um, make it have zero holes without ripping it. Um, and so, I'm, so a topological insulator is something that cannot in some uh, way be distorted into an ordinary insulator. Um, so again, I'd be happy to answer questions if you're interested. So you need a topological insulator the materials that show this sort of property um, are often layered compounds. Uh, they usually have very heavy, heavy atoms in them. So um, one of the famous examples is bismuth selenide, which is a layered compound that's 
selenium, bismuth, selenium, bismuth, selenium. That stack of five, which is called a quintuple layer, is about one nanometer thick. And then you can imagine you stack them on top of each other. So, um, so if you look at the electronic states of this system, what I'm showing on the right-hand side is um, from what's called a photo emission measurement that uh, you use light to knock out electrons. And by seeing where, where the, what light you needed to use and where the electrons fly out, you can tell what the states of the electrons were. And so uh, this is what's called momentum, and that's energy. And there are states, um, there are states uh, down below that are called a valence band, states above that are called a conduction band. And then in between, if you look closely, you can see that there are states that connect the two. And those are the states that live at the surface, the top surface. So that's the first ingredient. Uh, the next ingredient is magnetism. So if you um, could take this topological insulator and you could make it into a magnet, um, then it turns out that you could, um, so well, let, let me first say uh, a magnet, how many of you have heard of the Hall effect? Okay, um, so can someone uh, tell me about the Hall effect? So, uh, so hysteresis comes from the magnetism. That I'm sorry that it doesn't show up very well. I should have um, put the labels better. But this is what's called the Hall resistance. It's you drive a current in one direction, and you measure a voltage that is perpendicular to that current, not a voltage along the wire, but a voltage across the wire. Yes, for example, in a van der Poel geometry, uh, is a good way to to measure this. So. Um, so you get a voltage because electrons are deflected by a magnetic field or by magnetism. And so you tried to drive a current um, uh, from me to you, but in fact it, it went off toward the door. Uh, the, the electrons got um, deflected. And so you measure a voltage that way. And in this case, this is in a particular um, metal that has magnetism and what's called spin-orbit coupling. And you can see you can measure a voltage of around, uh, sorry, uh, an equivalent resistance of around one ohm from the Hall resistance. And you can see that uh, as you sweep a magnetic field, uh, you, you can flip this resistance. Um, and that's telling you that you can flip the magnetism in the sample. So those are the ingredients. If you add magnetism to a topological insulator, it turns out it can destroy these surface states. I, I lied to you before. I said there's no way to get rid of these uh, surface conduction. Actually, there is a way. You can break the symmetry that guaranteed that surface conduction. And you, that symmetry is time reversal symmetry, the symmetry that things are the same forward and backward in time. So if you add magnetism, and specifically magnetism that's poking perpendicular to the surface, then you can destroy. Uh, uh, the surface states, and if you squint a little bit and have a loving uh, attitude towards this, you could imagine that there's a gap between the states above and below here. Um, it's just about at the resolution of what photo emission can, can show, but we, we can see it in other ways. All right, so since we're physicists here, um, I would like to consider a spherical topological insulator. You may have heard that physicists like to consider a spherical cow to approximate the behavior of cows. Uh, so we'll take a spherical topological insulator that is magnetized from the south pole to the north pole. So in the northern hemisphere, the magnetism points, points outward. And so it kills, the, uh, it kills the surface states in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, the, mag the magnetism points inward uh, because it's pointing from south to north. That looks inward in the southern hemisphere. And so it kills the magnetism. But right along, along the, the equator, um, the magnetism is tangent to the plane, tangent to the surface. It's not poking the surface. And so it doesn't destroy the, the surface conduction. In fact, it turns out that you're guaranteed to have a perfect 1D wire that goes around one way. And if you flip the magnetism of this whole thing, that 1D wire would go the other way. So, all right, we, we can't make these so easily in spheres. Um, so it's more convenient to flatten it into a pancake. And now we have a top surface, a bottom surface. Those two have no surface states because of the magnetism.
but the edge still has magnetism and the conduction can flow one way around. So that's, that's the scenario. Um, so to measure these things, it turns out, I mentioned that being able to have no, no backscattering, no deflection, electrons can't turn around, that really makes it a lot easier to make a perfect 1D wire. But um, these materials are really very dirty. And my group doesn't grow materials. Um, we, with you know, a couple of exceptions, but mostly we make very small structures out of the materials and we make precise electrical measurements, often at low temperatures. So, so we get materials from some of the growers who are making the best materials in the world, but still, when something's new, often you don't know um, whether, it's, um, whether it's a rotten apple. <laughs> uh, so, um, so if you have to cool things down to very low temperatures, and it turns out we, we did for this project, then um, it normally takes a long time to do that. Um, so we, we cool things down to tens of millikelvin, so hundredths of a degree above absolute zero. And you can imagine it takes a while to get all the heat out of something. Um, when I was in grad school, it took you know, a day and 24 hours to get things cold, and that was if we were really working our tails off. Um, um, so we worked with a company that uh, made these cryostats um, and designed something that allowed us to insert a sample to not warm up the entire cryostat, the entire refrigerator, um, but to insert a sample and to have it from room temperature to cold in about six hours. Um, so, so that was a really big deal. We could have fast turnaround. We also had to put filters on the wires so noise from room temperature would not uh, shake up the electrons in the system. We have a big magnet because we wanted to be able to reverse the magnetism of the system. Um, and we can also rotate the sample in any direction so we can point the magnet in the plane or normal to the plane. So um, this is what uh, the probe looks like that goes down into it. You can see there's a lot of pretty fancy wiring on it. If you look even closer, this is what the, the boards that we built to do the filtering look like. And um, this is the, uh, the rotator that can um, tilt in any direction relative to the magnetic field. Um, and uh, all of this was assembled by uh, a former student of mine, well, who was then a student of mine, um, Andrew Bestwick. And um, I get the privilege of having students who go off and do all kinds of amazing things, including, um, including figuring out how to um, measure the properties of soil so that farmers don't, uh, don't over fertilize the soil and have the runoff uh, poison streams. Um, but what Andrew went off and did was to uh, join a small company that focuses on quantum computing called Rigetti. It's in, um, in Berkeley. And um, he joined, I guess, probably two and a half years ago, and he's now the vice president of engineering of the company. Um, so people can go off and do a lot of different things. Yes. Steven, can I, I want to plug two things. One is for, for the long history of the department, and this is because of Joe 10, we have this long tradition of keeping track of what our students have done in the past and into the future. But I wanted to say that your site is particularly good. Our, our students, if you want to see a site of someone who, as an advisor, is keeping track of where their students go, you have a really nice thing on your home site about the people that have worked with you as, as graduate students, as postdocs, and where their positions are. And so. It's something we take pride in here locally, but I, I, I've never seen a better um, site for a mentor and, and his students than your, than your site. Thank you very much, Scott. So I, I think some of that stems from the fact that I'm, uh, I want to support my students and, and I'm proud of them regardless of what direction they want to go in. Um, it's not unknown for, uh, for physicists at, um, at um, um, at universities with PhD programs to feel that the greatest thing that one can do in life is become a physicist uh, and specifically a professor at a university, go figure. Um, um, and so, um, so there, are, there are faculty who would really prefer to see their students go into academia. And I'm very happy when my students go into academia if they're happy because it means that I get to interact with them over maybe decades to come. But um, 
but I also appreciate that there are many other wonderful things you can do with not just a physics undergrad degree, but also a PhD in physics. So, um, so I think I'm, I'm going to wrap up soon. Um, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about how we made measurements on these samples. So if you look at, um, this is this material that I told you about. It, I mean, I said bismuth selenide. This is a, uh, this is a relative of it, which is antimony telluride, but with a little bit of bismuth sprinkled in to tune how many electrons are filled into it. And with some, cr some vanadium in this case, or in the case that we measured, uh, chromium to make it ferromagnetic, to make it into a magnet. And so if you look at these samples, they're, um, they were grown by um, depositing material in vacuum uh, by what's called molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, it's uh, a MBE stands for molecular beam epitaxy, but it's also been translated as megabuck evaporator because it's uh, something that is very carefully designed, but then you just heat something up and, you, and, and it evaporates and coats the surface. Um, and uh, so this is a structure where you can drive current from one end to the other and measure voltage across or along the, that wire. Um, and if you uh, look closely at this, you can see that it's a little bit ragged. I mean, uh, uh, it has blobs on it, it has sort of rough edges. And so that's actually, for me, an interesting story. These films are grown you know, very carefully but then we need to pattern them into a certain shape. And normally when we pattern things, uh, we use what's called lithography. It's a technique that was developed, um, the modern version of it was developed for uh, the semiconductor industry to pattern uh, integrated circuits and chips, and transistors, um, and uh, it's, you shine light onto a sample and you block the light in some places and where the light goes through, it makes some change to the sample that allows you to pattern it. So, um, so we are used to using lithography in my group and in fact, not even with light most of the time, but with a beam of electrons writing like a pencil, uh, which can get very fine down to about 10 nanometers, tens of atoms across. Um, and so we, we were doing lithography on these samples and we found that all of them had too many electrons in them. They, they didn't have, the right properties, they weren't insulating in the bulk of the material. And so I had to have a little bit of humility and to say, you know, I've been going around uh, talking about the pioneers in this field the, who were at Tsinghua University in Beijing in China and saying that the way they made their samples was by cutting edge lithography. That is by taking a very sharp diamond tip and scratching things. And so, I had to have a little humility and say, well, we need to do cutting edge lithography to make our samples. And in fact, in the early days of the semiconductor world, that's how people um, made structures. And so fortunately, I had a student who is not only uh, very wise in physics, but also has very steady hands and a lot of patience. So these features are about 100 microns, a tenth of, um, a, tenth of a millimeter, or about the thickness of a typical human hair. And he was able to, uh, to make make those little, um, uh, little wires that went off to the side. So once we did that, uh, and then drove a current through here and put a magnetic field on the sample, you can see that there was a Hall effect, that the electrons seem to be deflected one way or the other, and the Hall effect is really large. Before I showed you one ohm, but now it's about 26 kilo ohms. And it's the same 26 kilo ohms that comes from uh, the resistance of a 1D wire, the re reason is that um, we're inserting current from one side, or let's say we're inserting current from one side, it comes along the edge of the sample and let's say hits this contact, and the current, um, the return current comes from the other side and it hits that side. So basically, when we're measuring a voltage between the left and the right while driving the current vertically, it's, it's pretty much the same as if we were measuring the two terminal resistance of this perfect 1D wire. Um, because uh, from one side it comes, it, it comes to one contact and from the other side it goes up the other uh, side of the sample to the other contact. 
So I know that's a little hand wavy, but uh, so uh, so when we measured this, uh, well, when the group in Beijing measured this, they found within a few percent of the value it was supposed to be, and the value it was supposed to be uh, is um, a combination of fundamental constants of nature, h over e squared, so Planck's constant divided by the electron charge squared. Who knew that that was a resistance? But it, it is a resistance. It's twenty five thousand eight hundred twelve point something ohms, um, and um, and I should know the number more precisely because until about a year ago, it actually was the basis of the definition of the ohm was that it was 25,812.8 uh, and so on with a few more digits because this can be measured to a part in a billion accuracy, part in a billion precision and accuracy. Um, and so the group in, in Beijing had shown this beautiful experiment, but they were at a few percent. That was good enough to suggest that it was really coming from this behavior, but, um, but um, when I wanted to, my group wanted to build on it, we decided we had to do better, and we ended up measuring to one part in 10,000, that this was equal to, uh, to h over e squared to one part in 10,000. Nowhere near what can be done with a magnetic field and a very clean semiconductor, which is a part per billion, but still pretty impressive. It's not an accident. Uh, and then, since then, we, um, we did learn how to do lithography, now with light on the sample, not with electrons. Um, and uh, we could put an electrode on top to tune the density of electrons in the sample. That's called a gate. Uh, we can see the effect of a gate that, sorry, uh, of course, yeah. Um, one more. Um, we can see the effect of the gate, that it, it uh, makes it much crisper, that uh, without a gate voltage, there's some residual voltage drop along the wire. This is the longitudinal voltage, the drop along the wire. And you can see with applying the right voltage, there's almost no voltage drop along the wire at zero magnetic field. If we zoom in, there's really almost no voltage drop. So remember, uh, the voltages here are tens of kilo ohms. But if we zoom in, we see it's less than an ohm um, uh, voltage drop along the wire. Uh, and um, we need to be at very low temperatures for this. Um, uh, if we get to about a Kelvin, it's far too high. The electrons get excited and they can go through the, the bulk 2D states. And uh, that's another thing that we don't understand. Uh, it should, we should be able to go to much higher temperatures and we're working on figuring that out. Um, and um, most recently, my group made better measurements. This is, this is looking at the uh, conductivity as a function of one over temperature and it's on a log scale for the conductivity, and you see, so you see it's dropping off exponentially as you go down in temperature. Uh, that's what's called an Arrhenius behavior or activated behavior. It's showing that temperature is what's jiggling things. Um, so we'd like to be able to look at very low temperatures. We need better measurements, and so we used a tool that's called a, um, a uh, squid-based current comparator something that the professionals at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies shared with us and, and helped us use. And with that, uh, we were able to make a measurement to about two parts in 10 million. So we're getting close to the, the levels that are metrologically important. And you can imagine now that you could have in just uh, a regular precise factory, you could have a standard that's used, that's what you need to, de uh, to determine the value of the ohm. Um, and that's particularly important because just this year, this international system of units was changed so that you're, it's no longer dependent on a um, kilogram of platinum meridium in Paris, but instead it's all based on electrical measurements, including this kind. So if you could make this kind of measurement and make it good enough that you didn't need a big magnet, you could do it um, with no, no magnetic field, but just with magnetization of the material, then it could potentially make it much more available. Right now, we're far from that. We don't have good enough um, precision of, on the measurement, we still, but that, I think, could be achieved in the next couple of years. It still needs to be very cold. We need to understand that and push it up in temperature. But if those could be achieved, um, then I think it would be really a um, pretty cool thing. And, um, and there's actually no fundamental reason that it couldn't be done even at room temperature. So 
Um, so with that, I'm going to, uh, to break since we're uh, near the end of the time, and I'd like to invite you if you'd be interested to ask questions. questions till five and then then we'll release those of you that need to leave but let's let's have our attention for the next few so, minutes for the first round of questions um, yes so, so oh, uh, you can correct yes yes so um, maybe tell me your name once more uh, ben. ben and then uh, yes ben thanks so could you go what was the uh, traffic model that you were using yes originally? um so um all right so let me think what I should show. Let, let me go um, uh, to, um, all right, so the, the traffic model that I was using, I gave two examples. One was where we had a two lane highway. The current could go in either direction but um, there was a law on no U-turns. Um, and it turns out that the no U-turns, um, does anyone here do photography? So you know that it's really frustrating in, unless you're trying to film a Star Trek movie, it's really frustrating if there's glare off the lens. Um, um, and so it's nice that you can prevent reflection of light from, um, from a piece of glass by coating it with a coating that has a particular thickness. Does anyone know why that works? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so you have a difference in refractive index, so you would have reflection at the surface. And then it is the refraction, refractive index of the coating that's important. Or, um, so um, this is a bridge. Mm -hmm. So, so the um, so you could do something gradual, but the simplest anti-reflection coating, um, you just want to have that the light that bounces off the front surface of the anti-reflection coating and the light that uh, bounces off the back surface um, have a difference of half a wavelength um, between them. And so, what happens if you take two beams of light or two two beams of electrons? and they're wave-like, and they're shifted by half a wavelength. Uh, so, yes, right, exactly. So destructive interference, as Earl said. So, um, so the, although the physics behind it is a little more sophisticated and is based on what happens when electrons of different spin turn around, um, something if I would encourage, if any of you are interested in quantum mechanics, look up Berry phase. Um, it's just what's called a geometric phase. So, so there's a really cool reason why it happens, but it's basically that there are two paths that should destructively interfere with each other. There are two ways that you could, if you could back backscatter from something, there are two ways you could do it, and they uh, they they destructively interfere with each other, so you can't do it. However, that turns out to be wrong in practice. Uh, I mean, it's right in the model that one can write down, but in practice, in these 2D topological insulators that have electrons that go in both directions along the edge. In practice, you can't go more than a few microns before you turn around, so they don't work as uh, as perfect wires. Yeah. Um, if, what, uh, if you're willing to answer, what, are the, uh, what did the math professors say when you asked them about the PhDs in mathematics when you really brought the traffic dilemma? Um, so it's a good question. What do PhDs in mathematics uh, say when I bring up traffic uh, issues? So um, some mathematicians like engaging with physics and they realize that the messiness of physics is actually exciting and can sometimes give rise to some of the most um, exciting developments in mathematics. So for example, string theory is not mathematics. It's not clear that it's physics either. Um, it's something, something in between. Um, but it's given rise to some really important developments in, in both areas. But generally, things can't be proven very rigorously. And so, um, so I would say there are things that can be proven within a certain set of assumptions, a certain model. Um, and 
I haven't, I haven't really talked with PhD mathematicians at that level uh, of discussion, but I think that when I explain what, in what sense we're talking about topology, for example, I think that they understand that's. So James, and then. Uh, so in your uh, description of measuring the, the ohm, yes. the unit of resistance, you mentioned that um, it's, in, instead of having the, the one-dimensional wire in a magnetic field or a strong magnet, as you showed in your setup, um, that you could use a material that was magnetic instead. Would the strength of the magnet or the magnetic material have to be the same as the magnetic field that you're putting it okay. into that, for that to work? So that's an excellent question. James was asking, am I cheating? Is there really a magnetic field there? Um, it's just a magnetic field that's confined within the material or... Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. I don't know... In electricity and magnetism, do you do, um, do you look at properties of materials? So for example, dielectric properties and permeability. Um, yes, a little a bit. So, so, um, so, the, um, so within a material, um, you have both a magnetization and a magnetic field. So there's uh, the, um, well, I, I guess, for, for electric fields, there's the displacement field and the electric field and a polarization. Uh, and so those are related to each other. And si there's a similar thing for magnetic fields. So you can have a magnetization um, uh, without having a magnetic field, for example. Um, and in, even if you have a magnetic field, it may be, so do you know where magnetization in a material comes from? What, what about the material? So, so does anyone know where magnetism comes from? Spin, spin coupling, spin momentum coupling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. It comes from the neutrons. Mm -hmm. Well, so neutrons certainly have magnetic properties uh, and can be used to, to probe magnetic materials. But when we, when we think about our typical magnets, it is indeed the spins of electrons that, um, that give the magnetism. So if you've taken a chemistry class and looked at Hund's rules, you know that certain atoms like to have the electron spins lined up in the same direction when you have, say, a half-filled shell. Um, so spins are little tiny magnets. Um, and so, um, so if you, um, so magnetism in materials comes from electron spins. And those electron spins can interact with other electron spins. And it turns out that electron spins often like to line up with other electron spins. So you don't necessarily need to have a magnetic field. You can have um, behaviors that really occur because of the interaction of the, the spins that produce the magnetism and the spins of the electrons that are moving. Does that give you some sense? So does someone um, in the back? I'm going to uh, suggest we continue with our yeah. questions yeah. after a brief sure. break. I have one, so I'm going to, oh, well, Shane, go ahead. Oh. No, it's just a fairly simple question. You were showing us your experiment that you were doing where you brought it down to 20 microkelvins? Uh, so it, it was actually 20 millikelvin. There are systems that can go even lower, yes. Um, how big was it? So now you're talking about like infinitely long wires and finite. Like, mm -hmm. um, I couldn't tell with the picture of how big it actually was because I was really curious. So, so, um, so, so Shannon, um, how big the the refrigerator that did this was, or how big the, um, the wire structure was? The actual um, device that you constructed. Yes, excellent. Uh, so, yeah, sometimes questions can be simple, but those are dangerous because the, <laughs> the answers are not always simple. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll show you the ones that we um, made later uh, using lithography. So the, the first ones were about a millimeter long and the smallest features were about a tenth of a millimeter. Or maybe they were even several millimeters long. So pretty big. You can see them with the naked eye. Certainly under a microscope, you can see them very nicely. Um, then with lithography, we can make structures. Um, well, the, the lithography that's used to make computer chips that you have in your cell phone uh, can make structures down to about 15 nanometers. Uh, and 
that's using light, but it's not, not visible light, not ultraviolet light, it's very deep ultraviolet light with, uh, with a very tiny wavelength. Um, those, those systems are very temperamental and expensive, and so you, you have to be um, making something big that you're selling, like lots of computer chips, to have them. But at, um, at universities, we can, make, we can use light to make features down to about half a micron, so that's, that's about the wavelength of visible light. Um, uh, and then we can also make things just as small as they can make in industry, but using an electron beam. Uh, it's much slower because you have to write like a pencil instead of flashing once, uh, but, um, but you can go down to 10 nanometers or even smaller. So um, as I mentioned, we switched over to the optical lithography, lithography with light, and here the features get as small as about one micron, but the scale bar is 100 microns. So it's about 100 microns across this little, um, this little bar or wire and a couple of hundred microns long. Um, and uh, the thicknesses are much smaller than that. The thickness I didn't mention, but the thickness of the film that this wire was made of is about six nanometers. So six quintuple layers of these stacks. Um, so that we didn't need to make. Uh, collaborators of ours grew that by uh, evaporating material. Does that answer your question so much, Jen? Sure. So, so yeah, my, uh, yeah, <laughs> that was my way of putting my hand up. I guess yes. saying I have a question. Okay. Um, my question was about you were talking about the the, the voltage measurement across. Uh, yes. So on the four wire sample, mm -hmm. uh, my my question is kind of twofold. One is about just thinking of that in terms of your funnel model. I know it's a toy model, but it's still this sense that we need to get to this, this modal state or a specific wave function to be moving through. Yes. Um, isn't, isn't the going across, I mean, it, you know, if, if you end up with the same, weren't you saying the, the same voltage drop that you get, if you basically look at the wire itself was acting yes. as a perfect wire. Right. If you attach it to the end, ends of the wire. And the ends know. of the wire is almost the same as if it's going across at any one point. Yep. And so I get that in a sense, which is sort of like uh, in the toy model with the funnel, it's, it's sure. I need this, I need to get rid of this momentum, this dissipation is yeah. to, to drop it down in there. So. At some level, I see that. Except, I mean, may, maybe it's maybe that's just just fair. What, what are you talking about? It's the, it's the direction orthogonal to it. But at some level, it's its own wire with its own sort of width. You've gone macroscopic in, in its width and the modes that it takes. Which is why I was thinking, like, can it really be as simple as simple as h over e naught for the charge of the electron? Because you, you know, that seems like a limit, but here we've got it where I can buy that this has to be the dissipation, the, the resistance in order to get one state. But to go across, don't I have in some sense to go across, I have all these possible states. So that's, so that's a really good question, Scott. And so, um, uh, let me, um, so, so let's look at this picture again. Let's look at the one on the right because it's a little less cluttered. Um, so I didn't explain this, I think, adequately, but here the 1D wire is the motion of the electrons along the edge of the sample. Uh, I sh should have been thinking of Hall effect for the entire yes. thing. So here to here, when I'm saying that, it's still Hall effect, it's still all surface transport. Yes, the, the, that answers my yeah, the, question. The only way to get from this side to that side is to go along the edge. At least in ideal, ideally the sample is completely insulating in the 2D bulk. That was what we got from the magnetism. Um, and so the only way to get from one side, let's suppose that we're driving current from bottom to top and measuring voltage left uh, left to right, then the only way to get from here to there is along the edge of the sample. Um, and of course, that's an idealization, but it turns out it's very, very accurate if we can get down to tens of millikelvin, and less so if we start getting up toward a kelvin. But that's why it, 
it retains that property, even though we've been talking about a 1D like yes. this, it's surface transport. And so yes. my mental model of, hey, now I have all of these kind of paths and all of these kinds of electron momentum or, or wave functions, no, I'm still limited because I'm still yes. working right. around. I got it. Right, because it's very thin. So if you made it thick also, if you made the film thick, then you'd have a sidewall that you could go along and you, you wouldn't have just one mode, you would have multiple modes along. I see. But it's, it's thin, yeah. So, um, gentleman back there and then here. Does yes. the film have any crystal structure? Uh, it's a good question. Does the film have crystal structure? So, um, yes. So, um, so most things are, have crystal structure. There are uh, things that do not, that are glasses or amorphous that um, locally have some structure, but it, as soon as you go a couple of atoms across, they don't have any what's called long range order. Um, but most things have crystal structure. It's just a question of what's the size of the crystals. Um, and the film that I'm working with is, um, uh, let, me, let me show you a picture that may help you. Um, this is a picture about all the dirt in the samples, uh, all the complexity. So I, what I wanted to show you is this picture over here in the top right. Um, this is what's called an atomic force microscope image. So, um, so it's taking like a very sharp pencil and moving it along the surface and keeping track of when you have to lift the pencil. Um, and uh, so this scale bar is 200 nanometers and the height variations are three nanometers. So remember I told you that one, one of these quintuple layers, one of the sort of units of this um, film is about one nanometer. So there are actually pretty big variations in height across the sample. Each of these little steps, if you see these, if you imagine that this is like a topographic map, then this is a ziggurat. It's like a, well, it's not square, it's triangular, but it's like a stepped pyramid. Um, and every step is one quintuple layer. So first of all, you can see that the film is not perfect in the sense that it's, it, it has bumpiness. But um, you can also ask, what is the size of the crystals? And my guess is that the size of the crystals is actually substantially bigger than this because it's grown on a, on a so-called substrate that has the same symmetry as the, uh, as the uh, film that's being grown. So, it's a good question. I'm not certain what the size of the crystals is, but I think it's I think it's pretty big. Um, but certainly, it's it, it's at least a few hundred nanometers. I was just trying to see the forest or the trees here in yep. your work. Is your work really centered on expanding theoretical knowledge and physics based on starting with first principles, or are you actually working on cutting edge future manufacturing techniques for computers or quantum? Computers? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so it, it's really a good question, and it, it's central to um, you know, how people do science, and different people have different approaches. Um, I'm excited about um, new phenomena uh, that occur when you make things small and when electrons interact with each other, and um, I'm excited about that partly because it's um, it's a new regime, who knows what we'll find, and some of the things that we can even predict are very counterintuitive. So I, I like that when we can make a simple prediction, and, uh, but if we saw that, it would seem pretty weird. Um, so for my own personal intellectual satisfaction, I find that it's often enough to just have a puzzle and try to figure it out or something that, uh, that would theoretically be predicted, but it's very strange. But I'm also inspired by how we might be able to work toward technologies. And actually, uh, uh, when, when uh, Scott was waiting for me earlier today, uh, when I had gotten here and then didn't show up on the third floor, I was getting a call from, um, from a financial administrator because I'm leading a proposal um, among a few universities uh, for how to advance materials to try to make um, new kinds of quantum devices, including things for quantum computing. So my own research has never been focused on quantum computing, but for a long time it's been proximal to it. It's been nearby, and I, 
I wrote a paper on what kinds of um, what kinds of new uh, devices and switches could you make by make, uh, in electronics by making things small. So I'm really quite interested in those points, but I still also am usually not focused on making something that um, that will be a useful technological widget in the next few years. I'm more thinking about what is the space of possibilities going on. I think that's a fantastic point to end on and then we'll continue.